kind of attitude does Jesus want us to have? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 18. All right. So we are in Luke 18. We are starting to get to the point where we're going to enter Jerusalem again. End of the chapters of Luke. And now we have the parable of the persistent widow. <laughs> Goodness. These are complicated parables. So he tells them a parable so that they know not to lose heart, it says, when they pray. They don't get discouraged. And so there's a city that had a judge, and the judge didn't care about people. He didn't care about God. And a widow of the city kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversaries. And he refused. He doesn't care about anything. And afterward, he said to himself, well, I don't care about God, and I don't care about people, but I really should do something about this widow. She keeps bugging me. So I'm going to do something for her so she'll stop pestering me. It said, quote, she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So he's annoyed by her. Interesting reference is that this word that's used about him getting beaten down by this poor widow, direct Greek quote is, lest by coming, she in the end gives me a black eye, which the commentaries say is a boxing term. <laughs> so he is feeling very beaten down by her, a constant pounding, it says. But the question is then, why? does Jesus tell this example? And the idea suggests that we have to pray. We have to be persistent in our praying, that any delay has to be endured and is a test of our faith. Jesus brings it back to God. Is Jesus not going to give justice to the people who cry out to him? Is he going to be long delayed? He will give justice and give justice to people speedily. But even so, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? We think about it when we think about people falling away from faith or generations who are unfaithful to God. Are we going to find faithfulness here? Which kind of gives me dread a bit. This judge, he didn't care about God. He didn't care about people. But even then, he gave justice. God cares about God and cares about people. And he is also going to give us justice. So by persevering, continuing to pray, and continuing to trust in him, having faith in him, we will get the justice we desire. So then he tells another parable. It says, to those who trusted in themselves, they were righteous and treated each other with contempt. Were they righteous? No, I don't think so. But they thought they were because they were very important people, probably. Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself and says, oh, man, it's grateful. I'm not like that other dude. I don't extort men. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer or even like this lousy tax collector who also at the temple. I fast. I tithe. I do all these things. But the tax collector is on the other side, standing far off. He wouldn't even look to heaven because he was ashamed, basically, by what he was doing. Beat his breast. God, have mercy on me. You know, a sinner. And Jesus reminds us that the man who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who is humbled will be exalted. God desires us not to have pride, not to have arrogance about who we are. I am glad I'm not like that other guy. But instead, that Pharisee should have been coming before God, confessing his sins and having humility before the Lord. Guy wasn't doing that. But the tax collector, he sure was. Pride in general, I think, is maybe the first sin or the biggest sin. We don't think of it as that way, but instead you're saying, I know better. We trust in our own abilities. We trust in our own method of life, but we don't trust in God. And then the other part is then we get contempt for other people. We start seeing ourselves as better than other people. Always remind myself that I am no better than other people around me. So I shouldn't have pride, but I'm also a sinner. I'm no worse than anyone around me. We are all sinners before God. And so I want humility before God, but I'm not also going to let people take advantage of me because they think they're better. And I'm sure the Pharisees were very angry about this whole entire story because he calls them out. And I believe he calls them out again because they're trying to do the good thing. They're trying to follow God. They think they're following God. They think that they have read the scriptures and figured out what God wants from them. 
And not only that, handily provided extra loss so you too could follow God just like we follow God. It was an arrogance that were there. I think the Pharisees are correctable in the sense that they are trying to follow God, but have gone the wrong direction. The tax collectors and the sinners are desperate. They know they're not following God. You know, you know when you sin, you're not following God. And they come, I think, to Jesus in a more honest way, at least the ones who realize they're doing something wrong. The commentaries will say that this word to be merciful is an ancient Greek word, and it's for an atoning sacrifice. So it's not just mercy. It is sacrifice on my behalf. That's what God is doing for this tax collector because he is coming. He can't even look at God and begging for forgiveness. So when people complain that Christianity is an exclusive religion, excludes people, it's not true. It includes everybody. The question is, are you going to go and live in the way that you know better, or are you going to come to God in mercy and with humility and asking for mercy and forgiveness? Jesus says to let the children come to him. That is the title in ESV. So they were people were bringing their children to him and hoping that their child could touch Jesus. Again, there's no special power in touching Jesus. But of course, when you have the Lord in your midst, you would want to bring your children, I think, to Jesus, hoping that it would make a lasting impression. Or I think the true meaning is that we hope that if you touch Jesus, you get some sort of special ability. But Jesus says, you know, don't hinder, it says, these children to come to me because theirs is the kingdom of God too. And whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like this child won't enter it. We should go in with a childlike faith. That's the thing that we always hear, that people should come in and children don't have guile. They're not plotting something from Jesus. They are coming and admiring him for who he is. Children are a little bit more honest. They haven't learned to eh, bury their words or say untrue things in the same way we have learned as adults. God tells them the kingdom of heaven is theirs too. This again is upside down of this of the whole world. The Romans, the Gentiles in general, would not have cared much for their children. In Judaism, there was more care for the children for sure. But if the Romans couldn't afford to raise another child. They just leave the child out in the woods. Christians became famous for taking those children and saving them, raising them because they were left to die. If you were a Roman king, your child mattered because now you have an heir to the throne. But in the regular Roman world, children were seen as people to work the land, people to inherit the land. It was not in the same way that God looks at children as the best in his kingdom of God. We have the parable of the rich ruler. We've heard this one before. So the rich ruler, who could have been a ruler in the synagogue, someone who was in leadership somewhere, calls him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We've talked about this before. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Are you calling me God? Because if you are, you're totally right. And he says, you know all the commandments, and he gives some of the commandments of the Ten Commandments and says, since you've kept them all, and then the rich ruler is like, yeah, I totally did all of that, (laughs) which is probably not true. But Jesus kind of glosses over that for the moment and says, you know, the one thing you still lack, even if you did everything I said you did, is that you have to sell all you have and give it to the poor. And then follow me. Someone said that he could have been the 13th apostle. When he heard it, the rich ruler was sad. And he says, quote, in ESV, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. But then we've seen this passage too in other gospels. Well, then who can be saved? I mean, if that's true. And then Jesus says, it's impossible with man. You can't save yourself, but it is possible with God. Peter is, of course, exasperated a little bit. He says, you know what? We have given up everything. There's more text in other gospels of what Peter says, but we've given up everything. We've given up our homes and our families and everything. Peter had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. He had a wife. And we've left everything to be with you. And Jesus says, truly, I say to you, there's no one who has left his house, his wife or his brothers or his parents or his children for the sake of the kingdom of God 
who will not receive many times more in his time and in the age to come eternal life. You've given up much, but it is going to come back to you because of what you've given up. And we've heard stories from Jesus before, from rich people, the farmer who stored up all his goods, the man who ignored Lazarus, who was being licked by dogs at his gate and died of starvation. But there are also people we know of the Bible, like Zacchaeus and Lazarus, I think Matthew probably, who were wealthy and still followed Jesus. It is harder for people to do it because. I think they depend on themselves. It's the same pride problem. I have everything I need. I can take care of myself. I don't need anything. And this rich ruler clearly depended on his wealth. And when was asked to give it all up and give it to the poor and follow Jesus, it's his trust fund. It's his bags of money that he was going to depend on. And now Jesus is asking him to give it up. Jesus knew his heart and he knew what he was going to say. It is hard for a rich person to come through the kingdom of God because it is hard for people to give things up because Peter asked the same question then. We had wives, families, brothers, sons, fathers, mothers, all these things. We gave them up. And Jesus was telling them, just like that guy can't give up his money, you gave up all these things, but you will get it back, either in this life and in the life to come, the eternal life. Don't fret about your stuff. We've heard that before, right? Don't stand on the roof when all your stuff's in the house, hoping to save everything, not going to save anything. The rich ruler, you're not saving anything. And to Peter, you have left everything, but you will have everything. Jesus then foretells his death, it says, for the third time. This is the ESV headline. So he's talking to the 12 and he says, you know, we're going to go to Jerusalem and everything that's been written about the Son of Man by the prophets. So all the things that you've known was going to happen to God's Messiah is going to happen now. Going to be delivered over to Gentiles, the Romans. It's going to be mocked, spit on, flogged. They're going to kill him. And on the third day, rise. And they said that nobody understood this. This saying, it says, was hidden from them because they didn't grasp it. Did they hide it from themselves? Did they understand it? We get it now because we have the Bible. We have now seen the impact this prophecy has had. And we also saw how it ends. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have it written down. They knew the Old Testament scripture. They knew that Jesus said this many times. But again, you get the fact that this was not sinking into their head. They're not prepared for what is about to happen, despite the fact that Jesus has said this. So while the apostles are getting it and they're understanding who Jesus is. They're not seeing the fullness of the story. I think that's why Judas fell away because we're going to go into Jerusalem and we are going to take back what is ours. Nope. Don't look at the things of man. Don't look at the stuff. Look at the kingdom of God. Jesus is fulfilling everything so that we may gain forgiveness, so that we may come back, and that it says what is impossible for man is possible for God. He is going to bring us back into the fold by his actions. So then as it got closer to Jericho, we're on our journey towards Jerusalem. There's a blind man sitting by the side of the road and he heard the hubbub from the crowd. And so the crowd told him, why is there such a hubbub? Oh, Jesus is passing by. Jesus of Nazareth starts crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. It said the people in the front were rebuking him. We know from other gospels, this guy was annoying and he kept saying it. He had the persistence, right, of that widow. Kept doing it over and over again. Have mercy on me. Jesus asked for the man to be brought to him. And what do you want? What do you want me to do? He asked Jesus to give him a sight back. Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. That persistence of the widow. And he gained his sight. He glorified God, remember? The one leper who came back and gave thanks, the blind man did too. And the people who all saw it gave praise, probably because that guy finally shut up. But they were glad this man was made well. This was clearly a ministry and a miracle of God. Now, people believe that this is the old city of Jericho. So we have the old city that had the walls blown out. There's probably homes and whatnot living among the rubble. 
Herod the Great built a new city of Jericho, which we're going to talk about next time. That was glorious. It's beautiful. And the climate is beautiful. The whole area is just gorgeous. And the weather is fantastic. It's 870 feet below sea level. That's about 2,000 feet lower than what I live. So that's pretty amazing. But Jesus does his miracle. And that ends chapter 18. What I'm going to meditate on is that idea of humility. Is there ever a time in my life where I thank God I'm not like that other person? Maybe I'm happy about my position in life. I have a home over my head. Are there people on the street who I could look down on because they don't have what I have? They don't have a home. They don't look like I do. I'm definitely going to meditate on that. And what I'm going to pray about is about having that humility God asks us to have. That I always have the humility to understand that everything is a gift from God. I always need his mercy. And not only that, in the sense of thanksgiving, that I'm not thanking for myself. I'm not thinking about the things I accomplish for myself. But instead, I have the humility to know that every good thing comes from God. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we do. Many times Jesus said things along the way and in other gospels where he says, is the student greater than his master? Are you better than I am? There's going to be places where we're going to see that in the future of the stories of the New Testament. But we should always have humility that we are a sinner coming before God and that we want his forgiveness and that we never gain that pridefulness that the Pharisee has, where you're saying, I'm grateful I'm not like that guy. I'm so much better than he is. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts. You can find them all either on the Bible and small steps.com. That is the website home for this podcast. The links are in the show notes or a better life in small steps. There's an A at the beginning of that, a better life in small steps.com, which is the home of all my podcasts. There's a blog there and that is ramping up. We're hoping that it's not going to be a fast blog that has a million articles on them, but short articles about just having a better life in general. 